Good morning. How are we doing today? I am a pastor in Middleburg, Florida, which if you don't know where Middleburg, Florida is, you start to drive west until you run into cows, uh, and that's where we are. So um, being a pastor in Middleburg, I would love uh, for everyone just to give me a yeehaw. You want to give me a yeehaw? Ready? One, two, three. That's what I'm talking about. Uh, So I am so glad to be here. I want to, first of all, honor uh, your pastor, Arlie. Thank you so much for who you are. We met um, uh, actually a few weeks before you launched. We were going through um, something with our relational network, uh, and you guys were about to launch and talking about all of those different things, and I remember praying for you guys and excited. Um, So blessed to know Wendy uh, and all the brains behind the bronze uh, and the beauty that comes with it. Uh, And so you guys are doing an amazing work back there. Uh, I am going to say I love that all of your daughters are participating and kids are participating. Um, But me and my wife began praying the moment we sat in that seat. Um, We're going to steal you. Uh, So if you want to come to our church and start singing, you are amazing. Uh, And so uh, is this your oldest or second oldest daughter? Your oldest daughter, uh, she's at Liberty right now, right? All right, when you graduate, you got a job, all right? Uh, And so uh, that was amazing, wonderful, um, absolute joy. Um, And so I am so thankful uh, to be here. Um, so at our church, um, I started about eight years ago, uh, before every sermon, we always pray for three things. First thing we always pray for before every sermon is the distractions in the room. Reality is, we're not talking about people getting up and moving around. We're talking about the distractions on our hearts. We all have it, right? The fight we got into, like, right before we got out of the car, and we looked at each other, and we're like, we're at church. Quit fighting. Put on a smile, right? And now you kind of got that bitterness. You got that bill that you just don't know how you're going to pay. You got this ups and downs. You're thinking about your to-do list. Like, you got to go grocery shopping after this, and all of those ups and downs. And those things can prevent you from hearing the gospel today. And so every sermon, we always pray for all the distractions to flee. The second thing we always pray for is the communicator. Um, I love preaching God's word, but let's be honest, you don't need to hear from me. You need to hear from Jesus. And so we're just going to ask that God move me out of the way and speak directly to your hearts. And the third thing we always do at our church is we pray for every seat because we believe every seat is a person and every person matters to Jesus. You matter. Hear me in this. You matter. The God of the universe died for you. The good news of the gospel is that our God died so that you could be set free. You could be forgiven of your sins. You matter. And so all we would ask for you to do is put a hand on a seat and pray for those who may gather here next week, that they may hear that and be changed by it. So will you, will you pray with me? So Jesus, thank you for who you are. God, thank you for what you're doing. God, thank you for this church. God, I am just humbled and blessed to be here. And God, I just ask right now, may all the distractions in this room flee. God, and would you just speak directly to our souls, Lord Jesus. We need to hear a word from you today. God, would you hide me behind your cross? These people do not need to hear from me. God, they need to hear from you. So God, we thank you for what you're going to say. Speak to their souls. And God, we anoint these seats. God, first of all, we're thankful for the men and women sitting in these seats because, God, they were knitted in their mother's womb to have a plan, a purpose, a hope, and a future. God, you have a plan for them. God, you saved them or will save them, Lord Jesus. And so, God, we just pray now for you to speak in their hearts. But, God, we also pray for you to begin to fill in these seats. God, as they move to their new building, and God, praise you for the miracle of this new building. But as seats go into that facility, Lord Jesus, will you begin to to move in a mighty way and send one family after the next that will become rooted in the gospel, rooted in community, Lord Jesus. And so, God, we just begin now praying for you to move. Thank you for what you're going to do. Anoint this moment in time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Again, I am excited to be here. Like I said, we're over in the Middleburg area, um, in the Clay County area, kind of on the border between Green Cove and Middleburg. I know that may not mean a, a lot to you, but I'm a Lake Asbury boy, and Lake Asbury is right in, right in the middle of Green Cove and Middleburg, and it's, it really comes around like three to four lakes, hence why it's called Lake Asbury. Uh, and so I've grown up there. I love Lake Asbury. I know this doesn't make any sense to you, but to me, Lake Asbury's home. It's where I grew up. It's where I pastor. I can't imagine with my wonderful wife uh, raising our four daughters anywhere else. I can't wait to grow old with you in Lake Asbury. Uh, I know I'm already getting there. Not you. You look great. Uh, and um, I love it, but if I'm not careful, like Asbury can, um, well, it, it, it can start to frustrate me because like Asbury is going through a lot of changes. I moved out there when I was in the fifth grade. It doesn't look the same now. Our county is in the process of putting 1,500 to 2,000 homes in the Lake Asbury area every year for the next 20 years. Our small little area in between Middleburg and Clay County is going to average about 6,000 people moving into it every year for the next 20 years. And again, I stress, Lake Asbury is not a large area. It's just around four or uh, three or four lakes. And so it's small. It's not Ponte Vedra. It is a small area. And if I'm not careful, I can start finding myself bitter because you know what? Traffic's going to get a little bit more. If I'm not careful, when I pull into the gas station and the convenience store, the line is going to be five to six people deep, and I'm frustrated because it's a convenience store. I should be able to get in conveniently and get out conveniently. If I'm not careful, I'm going to find myself frustrated because there's going to be a lot more snotty-nosed kids at the park that I take my children to, and I love my children. I really struggle loving anyone else's children. If I'm not careful, um, I will find myself more and more frustrated as more and more people move into the area. But I'm a pastor. I pastor in this area. And I have to remember, more homes mean more people. More people means more opportunities to share the gospel, to share the wonderful joy, the good news of Jesus with them. And much like Lake Asbury, I'm excited to hear about your growing pains, that in the next few weeks when you guys move into your new facility and you start reaching more and more people, the coffee lines, uh, they're going to get a little bit longer. Checking your kids in to, to, to Roots Kids, it's going to be a little more uh, time-consuming, and if you're not careful, you might find yourself getting frustrated with it. You may be able to remember after service, oh, I was able to talk to Pastor Arley for, for, for 30, 20, 10, 15 minutes, and now I don't even get to talk to him after service because other people are talking to him, and now I'm a little frustrated by that. And if you're not careful, you may see a God move, healthy growth, as something negative because you don't have the right focus. More people in the church means more opportunities for them to share the gospel with you, for you to share the gospel with them. So church, I want to thank you for letting me come and preach to you today. My prayer is that God will speak to us this morning, uh, that I look to inspire and change your life, that we will have a battle cry, a battle cry for this community. I know your pastor has a vision to reach this area for Jesus, to have the roots of the gospel go deep into this city. And so today I pray I can encourage you to keep your eyes focused on Jesus, focused on where you're going, not just the here and now, because we can all get bogged down with the here and now. And if we get bogged down with the here and now, we find ourselves a little discouraged. Anyone else sometimes get a little discouraged at gas prices? Anyone else a little discouraged when you go in and you're like, okay, bread used to be this much, now it's 
Not this much anymore. Uh, you get on uh, social media, don't even get me started on Twitter and Facebook and all of those things. If you get so caught up with that, you'll find yourselves discouraged. But if you turn your eyes to Jesus, you keep your eyes on Jesus. I truly believe if you look to where he's leading you, look to where he's taking you, no matter what happens, you can worship no matter what happens, you can find yourself encouraged, even in the darkest days, even in the darkest times. We can keep our eyes focused on where we're going. Because church, one day, all of this, it's gone. One day, the glorified church, one day, you and I, either the trumpet will sound or you'll breathe your last breath, and one day, the glorified church will stand around the throne room of God, perfect, holy. Sin has no power on us anymore. We do not feel the sting of it anymore. And for all eternity, we will worship God. No hospital visit, no chemo treatment, no speeding ticket can wound us anymore. We have the wonderful opportunity if now we keep our focus on there, on where we're going, we can be fearless, emboldened. See, confidence in our future home in heaven will produce a boldness here on earth. If you keep your eyes focused on where we're going, it will embolden you, empower you to reach the people around you as your roots grow deeper and deeper into knowing where you're going. Your roots will then spread out farther and farther to impact the people around you. Paul says this in Philippians chapter 1, verse 21 through 24. It won't be in your screens. It says this, form to me, to live is Christ, but to die is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet which shall I choose? I cannot tell. Verse 23, I am hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. See, Paul was confident in his afterlife. He knew where he was going. He was excited about it, but he knew as he stayed here, he could encourage the church. What would Pontevedra look like if we all had that same mindset? What would the surrounding area look like if you caught on fire, excited on where you're going and looking to where you're going, but knowing that while you're here, God could use you to change this city, use you to change this world. No pandemic could stop you. No government could hold you back because we serve the God of the universe who hung the stars in the sky. And so for the next few moments, let's talk about our future lives. For the next few moments, let's talk about where we're going and how it impacts this one. Uh, your pastor did a wonderful job of uh, making hand, uh, handy notes for you, fill in the blanks. Um, and I'm excited about this. Uh, I may have to start using this at uh, my church. So if you have your Bibles, um, I would encourage you to open them up to 2 Corinthians. We're going to go through 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. Um, I'm a verse-by-verse uh, preacher, and so what I'm going to do is we're just going to take it small sections at a time. We'll read a passage, and then I'll talk about it. Read a passage, and then I'll talk about it. So First Corinthians, or Second Corinthians, chapter five, starting in verse one, says this: For we know that if the tent, that is our earthly home, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in heaven. Pause. See, in 2 Corinthians, my church went through this book. We took him through line by line of this entire book. It's a wonderful book of talking about a church in dysfunction. Um, and in 2 Corinthians, Paul does a great job describing our bodies. If you go back to chapter 4, he actually calls us jars of clay. Now in chapter 5, he calls us tents. 
See, Paul would be familiar with tents because we know in the book of Acts, uh, chapter 18, Paul's job was a tent maker. So he kind of understood tents, that these are not permanent structures. These aren't the fancy ones that y'all in Ponte Vedra probably pick up from the sports academy that have AC units built in it and solar panels and probably things like that. No, these are like fabric animal hides that's like stretched out, tied with some rope um, over some stick and wood. These are not meant to last within a storm. These would eventually give out, eventually be destroyed. When our bodies begin to break down, when our bodies begin to hurt, it shouldn't bring us sadness. It should encourage us and push us to our final destination because we have a future building waiting for us, one built by the hands of God. So the first point that I want you to get is that we rejoice looking forward to our future bodies. We, look, we rejoice looking forward to our future body because every day you and I are one day closer to our heavenly bodies, one day closer, not being a chipped pot, not being a tent with a sore back, ladies and gentlemen, one day closer to new bodies, strong bodies, healthy bodies, and my hope, healthy bodies with thick hair, like really thick hair, like long, like I want 80s metal hair bare, like I'm rubbing it, you know, shaking it around like that. That is what I'm hoping for. This passage lays out really three things about our future bodies. The first thing it tells us is our future bodies are better. They're just better. Paul words it this way. He says, he describes our earthly bodies as tents, but our heavenly bodies as a building in a home, we go from a temporary structure to a permanent one. We experience a total upgrade, ladies and gentlemen. In every way, our heavenly bodies will be better than our current ones. Can I get an amen on that? The second thing it tells us is our future bodies won't break down. This translation for destroyed, the word is actually deeper in the Greek uh, it means to dissolve. It means when a city is overthrown. It means when a traveler gives up on its journey. The imagery that this Greek word actually means is a, um, a traveler who has gone so far in his journey, so overwhelmed in exhaustion that he unstraps his backpack and it just falls off of him and collapses down beside him because he just can't go further any longer. He becomes exhausted. Church, one day, these bodies, they'll tap out. They'll betray us, but not our heavenly bodies. We won't experience pain, sore backs, calories, not a thing anymore. Can I get an amen on that? Eat as many heavenly donuts as possible and not in any way, shape, or form deal with that. Our bodies don't break down. And the third thing is our future bodies, they're forever. It's all about location. Back before 2008, when I was uh, a few years into college, I worked for a real estate broker. Right before the crash of the market, 2006, 2007. If you guys remember back then, it was nuts, right? A lot like it is today. Um, houses were selling. You know, you had a, uh, uh, you know, it's like, is that a meth lab? I don't know, but it's going for $1.5 million. Like, those things were just selling like crazy. Um, and I remember that, and then I remember the market crashing. And I remember talking to, his name was Ross. He was a real estate agent for the broker, one of my closest friends and, um, at the time. And um, when the market crashed, I was like, what are you doing now? He's like, my job? Find locations. It's a year ago. It was all just about selling homes. Now it's about finding the right home. Because that back in the day, a year ago, before the market crashed, every home would sell. Now, after the market crashes 2008 and early 2009, only those homes with the best locations sold. Ladies and gentlemen, we have the best location. We will leave this earth, and 
one day be in all eternity around the throne room of God, worshiping the one who hung the stars in the sky. We can get excited about our future location. Moving on, look at the rest of the passage. It says this, For in this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling, if indeed by putting it on uh, we may not be found naked. Second main thing I want you to learn is this, is we groan while in our current bodies, but it's only, only temporary. It's only temporary. I looked at this Greek word. I love looking up the Greek words and the Hebrew words. And I looked up this Greek word for grown, and I'm like, oh, man, this is about to be good. There's about to be something really deep here and really profound. And when I looked it up, it just means, like, to murmur. It means just to be like, ugh, like, ugh, my back hurts again, ugh, type situation. But it picked me up, and, I, and something struck me when I was looking for it. It's that next word for longing, longing to put on our heavenly bodies. That means to pursue. It means to long for, to long after. It means to lust for. I'm going to say something bold, church. I pray it doesn't uh, offend you, but, I mean, I get to preach it and go home. Uh, um, I think too many Christians waste a pain. I'm fearful that many of you will waste a hurt because you're lusting after the wrong bodies. This passage says to long for our heavenly bodies, to look for our heavenly bodies. But I think too many times we lust after this one. We long after this one, getting sick, having pain, experiencing hurt and uh, loss. God desires to use all of it. But if we're not careful and we have the wrong perspective, our pain will make us bitter, not better. For many of you, my fear, my hurt, is that you'll look at your earthly bodies and God wants to use you for something, but you're too broken, you're too bitter, you're too frustrated that you'll miss it. It's not in my notes, but I'm going to deviate for a moment. Our oldest daughter is born uh, with a disability. Uh, when she was born, um, they called a degloving. Her hand got pinned in the womb, uh, and she lost blood circulation around her right hand. So when she came out of the womb, um, the, the skin uh, was, was peeled off of her body. They equate it to burns. You have three layers worth of skin. She had a third degree, so it went through all layers of skin on her underarm. Her top, second, lost the tips of her fingers, and a first degree burn around the outside of her hand. Her whole right hand is covered in scar tissue, um, which means as she goes from a baby to an adult, scar tissue doesn't grow. So everything tightens up and pulls in three weeks old, my wonderful bride started to take her to physical therapy. At three weeks old, our first kid, supposed to be one filled with joy and coos and cause. Three weeks old, my wife was driving to Emerson from good old Middleburg. Can I get a yeehaw? Yeehaw. Um, Every three times a week for surgery, nine months. She's now 11 years old and has had 17 surgeries in the last... uh, 11 years. We made a decision the moment we found out not to allow to make this to make us bitter. We made a decision that God was going to use this for whatever reason to make our family better and the gospel advance to the ends of the earth. We now have the hand, the leading hand surgeon in our area and really in the United States for pediatric kids we have his personal cell phone number. His name's Dr. Loveless. I call him on a regular basis, FaceTime him. We send him birthday gifts and say hello. He calls us and we say all these different things and wonderful situations. We've had the opportunity to share the gospel really all around our state talking about this wonderful joy and burden that we have that God is using every day to advance the gospel. 
the wonderful joy of looking at my 11-year-old and saying, I can't wait for the day. I can't wait for the day that you stand before a congregation and share your testimony of how God is using this to advance his kingdom. Ladies and gentlemen, these bodies, we don't lust after these bodies. We know that while we're in these bodies, God will use us. But God, if we keep our perspective, guys, if we keep our perspective on our heavenly phone homes, on our heavenly bodies, God can use us through all things. I just pray you don't become bitter, but you become better. Looking at the rest of the passage, it says, For while we are still in this tent, we groan, being burdened, not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Let me recap really quick. If you missed anything, How can we affect this world by focusing on the next one? Number one, we rejoice looking forward to our future bodies. Number two, we may groan while on our current bodies, but it's only temporary. Number three, nothing is left behind. I'm the world's worst at leaving things. I don't know about you, but I'm a... Right when I walk out the door, my wife goes, keys, cell phone, and wallet, because I will leave it. It's now to the point that it is a, is a recurring thing that my kids don't even lock the front door anymore when they leave, because then they, they know that their dad's going to get out, get into a car, get halfway down the street, and have to turn around and come back in. I pretty much do that every single day. I am the worst in this, to the point that we were backing out of, the par- um, out of our driveway today. I had my notebook and my sermon in hand holding it, and my wife looked at me and goes, do you have your sermon with you? And I'm like, actually, to be honest, I don't know. And I had to open up and make sure I didn't leave this somewhere because that would have been bad. I am the world's worst about leaving things behind. Paul's telling us that when we die, these things shouldn't be our concern. He says in this passage, what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. The things of this world shouldn't bring us such attachment that when we're leaving and going up to heaven and floating up to heaven, we're not sitting here, but oh, but God, I left my my, my car back there. Oh, but God, I, can we go back and get my house? Can we go back and get my kids sports trophies? God, can, uh, hey, God, can we go back? I, I, I really, really liked my workout thing. I really like this. Oh, I left my watches at home. Okay, hey, God, can we go back and, and, and get those things? I know I'm saying a couple things, but l- let me just do this. Hey, God, I'm, uh, 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 we're going now, but hey, whatever I need, and insert in here whatever would make you mad at me by me tell- saying this, Hey, can we get that back? See, all of this gets swallowed up by life in Christ, ladies and gentlemen. Nothing is left behind because everything is left behind. We are not taking any of this with us. U-Hauls don't follow behind hearses. We should be living our lives in this life as we are looking to the next one. C.S. Lewis has a great quote. He says this, My prayer is that when I die, all of hell rejoices that I'm out of the fight. That is a mighty prayer we should be praying on a regular basis. May the devil cheer when you breathe your last breath because no one else can hear the good news of of Jesus because of you sharing it with them. Can I challenge you just for a moment, church? If nothing is left behind, maybe our churches shouldn't be designed around our wants. You guys have a wonderful opportunity. You're about to step into a new building in a little over a month from now. 
you'll walk in and it'll have the new fresh car smell and it'll be all this and all of those things. And you have the wonderful opportunity that very first Sunday to walk in there and look at this building and anoint this building and pray over this building. Hey, God, may this building never be used to meet or reach my wants because you already have heaven. There are millions and millions of people around you who don't have Christ, who don't know Christ. The miracle of this building, yes, is used to encourage you week in and week out, but the miracle of the building that you guys are about to step into is to reach those that don't know him yet. And for us, church, we have the wonderful opportunity to look at this building, to look at our church and go, it's not about me. When the coffee line gets a little too long, it's not about me. When I don't get to talk to Pastor Arley every single week, it's not about me. When I don't get my favorite little seat and, oh, this is my chair and I sat in this chair from the very beginning and now someone else is sitting in this chair, it's, it's not your chair. You have the wonderful opportunity. I've been in a couple churches around our area Um, and country churches are unique. Um, I'm a pastor of a country church. Uh, We have a deer head on our wall. I'm a country (laughs) country church. Um, When I first started as Pastor Arlo was right, there was 50 people in our church, and uh, my wonderful Sunday, um, I grew the church from 50 people to 15 people. Uh, praise the God, nothing encourages you more uh, than that. The reality of it was the pastor had been there 34 years before I came. I took over the church when I was 28. He was the pastor there longer than I was alive, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. And I remember walking up and um, talking to some of the people, and uh, we had 15 people that first Sunday, and there was an older gentleman. Uh, He walked up to me, and he goes, he's been my pastor for the last 34 years. I can't follow a young guy. This is my last Sunday. Since then, God has been faithful. We were talking about this the other day, the craziness of how in the world our 100-year-old church, and when I say it's a 100-year-old church, it was hand-built in 1912. Literally, the trees that were on the property, someone took an ax, rode his donkey or his horse there, chopped it down, uh, and then turned it in, hand-scraped it into wood, into lumber, laid it down as the foundation that I still stand upon that day, that right now my church is worshiping in. There was, a, there was a tree that they couldn't pull out because it was so big. They had chopped it, but the tree stump was there. They couldn't rip it out because backhoes didn't exist then. And so they just made it a pillar for which the church stood on. You remember this, baby? We had, when we re- remodeled the church, the church was actually three to four inches leaning because the stump was dissolving. And we had to put like 20 thousand dollars in foundation work just because they had to try to figure out a way to get a tree out that which a church now stands on. Um, but here's the interesting thing about all of this. My, um, my church now worships Jesus to where Christians in 1912 started to sacrifice They never, in their wildest dreams, when they probably brought their sack lunch or whatever, and it was probably bland because they didn't have good food back then, I could imagine. Uh, It was probably like a meat pie or something. I don't know. Um, But could you imagine that day that they went out there and they were chopping down the trees? Would they have ever imagined, fast forward 100 plus years later, people would be giving and hearing the gospel still preached from that location? It wasn't about them. They set up the next generation and the next generation. My children now, because of those people before us, my children now have the wonderful opportunity week after week of hearing the good news of Jesus because those people sacrificed. Church, you have the wonderful opportunity. I don't think it's uh, by accident that your pastor chose this name. You have the opportunity to put deep roots into Jacksonville because it's not about Pastor Arley. 
Fast forward 100 plus, plus years from now, I mean, he's pretty healthy. He may probably still be alive then, but I don't know. Uh, after all, the rest of us are dead and gone, and he's still kicking, um, still wheeling himself up and playing the piano. Um, the reality is, you guys are putting a foundation for 100 years from now. It's not about you. Your wants and desires are dead in 100 years. But the gospel lives on. Ladies and gentlemen, my prayer is that you see this as a God movement. Last point is this. Nothing is left up to us. Second Corinthians, again, says this. He who has prepared uh, us for this very thing is God, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. Ladies and gentlemen, you and I have the gift of the Holy Spirit the gift of the Holy Spirit is a sign that you are an adopted son or daughter of Christ. Church, remember, the main reason why we don't fear our afterlife is because you didn't earn it. The good news of the gospel is that when you were an enemy, let me, let me, let me stretch some good theological truth for you on this. We have to understand the fact that every single one of us are not children of God. We are enemies of God. And then he adopts us into sonship. He adopts us into daughtership. And we get to become sons and daughters. The beautiful thing is that when you were born, you were born to a sin nature. You were born to rebel against the king of kings and lord of lords. And then at that moment, you did rebel and chose your selfish desires. And even then, our God looked down from heaven in a wonderful, wonderful um, forward thought. Saw you, saw you. Saw you, said, I am sending my son to save the enemies of me and bring them into the table so that they can be sons and daughters, heirs to all of this. None of this. Your salvation, it's not up to you. Praise God for that, because if it was, we'd lose it every single second of the day. Amen. I know we're at a place that I feel we may be heading into a dark time. I don't know if your pastor has been feeling that too, but I'm really worried and concerned about the next few months where we're going. Maybe a dark time for our country, but here's the good news of the gospel is that even in the darkest of times, the light of Jesus will shine. I'll end with this. Maybe our churches should be filled more with people praying, praising, and proclaiming than people complaining. See, when, when people get obsessed with media cycles, we get our focus off. But when people get obsessed with the gospel, their future home, we start to see a change the Bible says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, forgive their sins, and heal their land. Church, we have a wonderful opportunity today to put our eyes focused on on Christ, turn our eyes on where we're going, not get distracted about this, not make it about us, and get focused on praying, praising, and proclaiming, and knowing that our God, our wonderful God, will use us to take his roots and saturate this community with the gospel. I'm excited for your future, and I cannot wait to come back a year from now, already locked it in. That's what we just said. There we go. Hopefully I'm not getting kicked out. Uh, lock it in to preaching at your new facility, what God's going to do for you guys. It's going to be an amazing, wonderful time. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, God, thank you for all that you are. God, thank you for this church. 
Thank you for these people. Thank you for how you're going to use them. God, and what you're really going to do in Ponte Vedra because of this vision that's not focused, not focused on our wants and our desires, but God, it's focused on, on your heartbeat, on your desire, on your wants. God, may this church grow deep roots, deep roots in the gospel, strong biblical foundation that the lost may find sturdy ground upon. God, I ask for an, a, a, a blessing and anointing upon their pastor, upon his wonderful wife and kids. God, give them a fresh vision and a wind to lead. And may, God, you find a congregation. God, a congregation willing to serve, not to be served congregation that's not making it about them, a congregation that's not set on complaining, but a congregation that is set on praising, a congregation that is set on proclaiming, and a congregation that's heart is set on praying to you, Lord Jesus. Each and every one of them have the wonderful opportunity to play a vital role what I believe is going to be a strong, healthy church that a hundred years from now, Christians will be hearing the gospel because of what this, these people do now. God, this is a historical event. I thank you for it. Use them in a mighty way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you.